I have to wait a couple of minutes or seconds to make sure the live is done and also more people should join. Hello, everybody. Today we are going to have. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Today we are going to have a discussion on a topic that all of us would love to have culture. And it's also about resistance. It's about us. It's about how we will overcome oppression and power that works upon us, how we find our identities. Isn't it? I'm just waiting so that people would join us. Please keep your mics muted. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. There are uh, so many people here listening to me. Uh, one is my own classroom students, then our uh, everyday at eight students. There are so many people from uh, Culture Studies Research Forum. Uh, there are also going to be a lot of general public and people interested in cultural studies. This diversity of uh, the audience, some are students preparing for exams, some are research scholars, many of your teachers, some of you might be just people interested in culture. This diversity of the audience is um, symptomatic of or metaphoric of the very concept of cultural studies. Cultural studies is about diversity. It is about power that is everywhere. When you switch on your mics, you will assert power over me. And when I say, I'm going to mute you, you will not be able to unmute yourselves. I'll be exerting power on you. So it's ultimately about power. Whenever we say culture, it's about power. It's about the powerful people's ideologies working on the powerless people. Some of you said in the chat box, my, my, you're looking good, you're looking gorgeous or something. Why you think I'm looking gorgeous is also a matter of power. Because I conform to, I uh, come closer to the ideals of femininity and, you know, sari, pink sari, it's cute, it's beautiful, ornaments, uh, makeup, well, you know, well-made hair. Mm. The ideals in our mind, the closer I come to, the better I will look. If I'm wearing very unconventional clothes and I have disheveled hair and I'm not wearing any makeup, you will not say you are looking natural. You're looking good. You will say, you'll say, why don't you make up? Why didn't you put on better clothes? Why don't you look more awesome? Because that is the ideal. So unknowingly, everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we say is ultimately a matter of power centers, power politics. Hmm. We all have ideals in our mind, the ideal of a teacher, the ideal of a woman, the ideal of culture, the ideal food. So many women have this problem. Will my cooking be liked by the family? If guests are coming, will I be able to cook good food for them? You know, that uh, tyranny of the ideal. And also the tyranny of the real, the tyranny of the uh, true, the tyranny of, centers. This is what life is about. And here today, we are going to talk about life. We are going to talk about culture. So I suppose the people who are going to join us have joined. I have a, um, where is my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. I have to wait a couple of- Wait, 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 wait. Kalyani, well, let's- Minutes or seconds to- Are. Sorry about the disruption. Okay. 
So here we go. Culture Studies Overview. Well, this program, this lecture, I am addressing my uh, students. At the same time, I'm addressing the Cultural Studies Research Forum members. I'm addressing the general public. That is what I started talking about. This program is conducted by uh, Cultural Studies Research Forum, which is an open platform where a lot of researchers interested in cultural studies and related areas can be uh, participants. There, there is nobody who is really running the show from the center. It is everybody's uh, forum. Uh, you can, uh, incidentally, I am uh, like a patron. I am managing a lot of things, uh, connecting people. If you have suggestions, if you need to organize talks, uh, if you want talks on certain topics, etc., please get in touch with us, which means get in touch with me or my office. Uh, I will bring together the people and um, there will be lots of public lectures. Three public lectures were over a couple of weeks ago. You can watch uh, uh, two of those lectures in our YouTube channel. Uh, and upcoming lectures will all, all be uh, aired in the YouTube channel. So this will be like a library of videos on cultural studies, um, which you can use for your studies, for your research, for your uh, paper writing and things and so on and so forth. So I'm very grateful to all the people who work behind the Cultural Studies Research Forum. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for um, this opportunity. So at once, uh, my students are getting a Culture Studies Research Forum lecture, which they got two weeks ago as well. And uh, they are also um, here with me like a class. So it's, it's all in one. Culture Studies overview. With that introduction, let me go on into the topic. What is culture? The moment we talk about cultural studies, the first important question, please do not draw on the screen. Shriya, uh, the first important question uh, that arises in our mind is what is this culture? How do you define culture? Culture is a very amorphous and ambivalent and a very, um, you know, uh, a fluid kind of concept. Originally, culture means uh, the cultivation of certain values, certain behaviors, certain worldviews, uh, certain attitudes related to gender, related to religion, related to, sorry, related to festivals, um, related to dress, related to food. So culture studies uh, is about culture, which is about lifestyle of people, the, you know, the way in which people think and behave and communicate and relate to each other in the society. And when you define something as culture, when you define what should be worn, what should be eaten, what, uh, how you should live, you're automatically also defining how you should not live, what should not be eaten, what are the taboos, uh, what are the behaviors that you should not indulge in, in a certain religion or culture, etc. So culture uh, has a dichotomy, inherent dichotomy, uh, what is accepted as good and um, permissible and what is not permissible. So that dichotomy or automatically emerges within a culture. And culture is also about protecting these values and qualities that are given importance within a society. Culture is also about the protection of the values and um, the, the qualities, the virtues that a society or civilization or community uh, upholds as important. For example, uh, take uh, an example, the Rajputs, for example. We will come to all that uh, with, with examples or the Chinese, for example, or the Eskimos, for example. When you look at these communities or any community for that matter, you will see that these communities differ from each other. Some are vegetarian, some believe in bravery, uh, some believe in communal life while others live, uh, believe in individualistic uh, life. For example, American culture is about individualism. Whereas a tribal culture, a African tribal culture would be more about um, communal life. Did you understand? So what are the values in a culture that can be seen 
from the way they live, the way they dress. Look at this example. For, uh, this is a woman wearing neck rings. Neck rings, we have seen them. There are uh, such tribes or such communities in Africa, in uh, Tibeto-Burman uh, area, the Kayan people, etc. cetera. Uh, even our Kels, uh, who were the original inhabitants of uh, England, uh, the Celtic men wore some uh, rings around their neck like this. What do these neck rings mean? These neck rings mean um, beauty or wealth or social status, etc. Uh, apart from the fact that these neck rings deformed people's necks, uh, you know, like the foot binding of the Chinese, the neck rings also uh, deformed people's necks and it gave an illusion of a long neck. Did you understand? It was biologically a very big disaster uh, in the culture uh, to have this practice. So what are the implications of uh, this practice within that culture? What does it mean? How does it affect people? In what ways do, does power work in this particular practice of wearing neck rings? For example, same with the case of uh, vegetarianism. Some communities believe that vegetarianism is good. Vegetarianism is uh, related to uh, the sattvic uh, virtues or uh, the virtues of good people. The um, uh, non-vegetarians are rajasvic or they are uh, evil people, demon, demonic people. That kind of mythological beliefs that have given rise to prioritization of uh, vegetarian cults and vegetarian rituals and practices over non-vegetarian practices in certain communities. Whereas in certain other communities, non-vegetarianism is permissible and it, and it is part of religious rituals. Um, and also, uh, for example, clothing, like wearing a sari or wearing jeans or wearing um, certain kinds of um, attire for certain festivals in everyday life and so on and so forth are also um, cultural events or cultural moments that cultural studies would look at uh, as symptomatic of power relations and identity politics. Did you understand? Now, um, Take another example. Uh, here we have the Rajputs. As I already mentioned, uh, the Rajput community, as everybody across India would know, gave a lot of importance to bravery. Uh, the Rajputs gave importance to bravery, while the uh, North Americans or the native Canadians gave importance to totemism. What is totemism? There is a little bit of totemism in Hinduism also. Uh, for example, when I was a child, my grandmother used to tell me that you are you belong to this star and this star has this plant, this animal, this bird. Um, I am related to the monkey of all things. I'm related to my, my star relates me to the hen. I'm a non-vegetarian and my parents used to say you should not eat uh, chicken because uh, that is your bird, you know, things like that. What does that mean? Ultimately, that means every totemism, this is totemism, that means every human being is related to nature in so many different ways. Uh, there are plants uh, that protect us. There are animals and birds that protect us and that we are supposed to protect as well, I suppose. So these kind of beliefs uh, uh, that existed in certain cultures um, made them very different from other cultures. Now I have got from the internet um, a, a certain picture here, understanding religious evolution, animism, totemism, shamanism, paganism, and progressed organic religion. I'm Well, I'm not going into this, but this reminds us certain things. We all began with pre-animism when uh, prehistoric men danced around the fire, etc. Around 100,000 years ago, there was animism and it developed into a more organized, a structured kind of pagan religion called totemism. From there, it went on to shamanism. And from there, it went on to pagan religions like Christianity sorry, sorry, Hinduism, pagan religions, like for example, our Hinduism, and uh, which the Westerners called pagan. And then after that, it progressed to organized religion, which means religions like Christianity, Semitic religions like Christianity. So this progress, progression that is given here automatically places Christianity at the end of the evolution. Did you understand the Semitic religions like Christianity? or Islam are organized uh, religions that are placed at the end of the evolution. So where we stand in this progression 
in this line of progression, in this timeline, where we stand is very, very important. That, that makes us either primitive or very modern. So you know that the very, uh, from a cultural studies perspective, from a post-colonial perspective also, um, you can see that the uh, very crux of uh, colonialism, or the very uh, central issue, the focus of colonialism was uh, the evangelical efforts to spread Christianity. And this was based on the belief that Christianity is more developed, it is more um, civilized and organized compared to pagan religions like the tribal religions of Africa or the tribal religions of Native Americans or the religions of India for example. So to wipe out these primitive, so-called primitive religions, like, that is a white man's burden that you see in uh, novels like, um, say, Heart of Darkness. And the same kind of evangelical zeal is there uh, in contemporary uh, societies where people try to uh, fight the beef eaters. Beef eating is considered primitive and bad. It is associated with certain religions and communities. Um, within India, uh, I have to say this because uh, a lot of uh, states across the country uh, believe that um, Kerala is uh, somehow bad or backward because people in Kerala eat beef. Now, I will tell you a, a personal anecdote uh, from the cultural studies perspective. I went to the Northeast and um, uh, I, I saw a lot of different customs and rituals there uh, in Assam, Manipur, etc., which are very different from uh, whatever customs, rituals that we are used to here. And their, uh, their uh, dietary habits are also, uh, not all of it, but some of it is very, very different, very um, un unusual uh, in the rest of India. And uh, one uh, professor I met uh, in Assam uh, told me that there is a special, very special dish of a certain community in the Northeast that is made out of blood of animals, blood. And uh, <clears throat> I am a non-vegetarian, of course, but I'm not used to eating uh, anything made out of blood. And uh, I said, no, thank you. I don't want to eat it. And then we got into a very academic discussion, a cultural studies based discussion uh, on this food item. And uh, I said, uh, a lot of people would find it very peculiar. But when I went to Thailand, for example, they eat insects like scorpions and cockroach, or not cockroach, I think some other roaches and insects like that. There are, whole, there are street vendors who would fry all these uh, insects and put them neatly arranged. And it's a very great delicacy. A lot of people come and eat it. In Japan, you see that people eat raw fish, uh, tuna, I mean, uh, salmon, tuna, etc., are put um, raw on sushis. So these are all practices that other communities may not easily accept. And then this professor with whom I was having an academic discussion about the Northeastern uh, food habit of um, uh, eating a dish made of blood, uh, he said that you should understand there is a history behind it. He said, once upon a time, they, these people were uh, suffering from drought and they were suffering from natural calamities and the rest of India, India did not really care about them. They did not get enough support and they were living in, uh, in uh, not, uh, you know, these tribes, th that is what he's talking about. These tribes where this practice of blood eating uh, began, they um, were so deprived of food and uh, they couldn't afford to throw away even the blood of the animals that they killed. They could not even throw away the blood. So it so happened that in history, uh, the blood was preserved and it was cooked and uh, this uh, delicacy, um, you know, developed. That, that it is a delicacy, that it is a very sought after dish in that tribe or in that community shows that in those days when that dish developed, People were, must have been so much starving that this was this meant so much to them. This dish meant so much to them. So every cultural practice, whether it's beef eating or eating this peculiar dish made of blood or eating scorpions, whatever the food habit is, whatever the, uh, the dress habit is, whatever the cultural uh, habit or ritual is, will have a history behind it. We'll have the history of uh, power, the, the history of powerlessness and deprivation, perhaps, the history of suffering, 
I'm reminded of um, Grandfather, the poem by A.K. Rama, uh, no, uh, Jayanta Mahabhadra, where he talks about the Odisha drought, or it was it flood, drought, when uh, his, the Pasana's grandfather had to eat neem leaves or some leaves uh, because there was so much dearth of food, lack of food that, um, you know, they, so many of our rituals are based on trauma, perhaps, in history. So the, 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 with that introduction to uh, general cultural uh, practices, let me go on to talk about what is culture. Culture is definitely a social behavior. Culture refers to the arts, the festivals, dance, music, fashion, lifestyle, all the things that people do in their everyday lives. And it also refers to our beliefs, our morals, our law, customs, habits, how uh, we behave and how we live. Margaret Mead famously defined culture as the learned behavior of a society. When children grow up from the time they are uh, able to understand language, we teach them, do not do this, do not do that, eat this, this is good for you. You know, the, in, in Kerala, uh, as well as in, in many other parts of India, I'm sure, the first taste that a child gets other than mother's milk is the taste of herbs that are very bitter and sour. Uh, that you um, put on the tongue of the child. And from there begins the acculturation of the child. It's called acculturation. It is the way in which the child acquires our culture. The child acquires our beliefs and practices and morals and virtues. Raymond Williams famously defined culture like this. Culture includes, uh, sorry, uh, culture includes the, oh, just a minute, I have to move something out of the way. Yeah, culture includes the organization of production, the structure of the family, the structure of institutions which express or govern social relationships, the characteristic forms through which members of the society communicate. He has just put together some different uh, disparate elements, the organization of production, Production does not mean producing objects. Production, culture as production. Culture as production of values, production of relationships also, in that sense also. Organization of production. The culture also includes the structure of the family. In some uh, communities, we have joined families. In some communities, we have um, you know, very uh, nuclear families. In some communities, women marry their uncles. In other communities, women marry brothers. In other communities, women marry, uh, cannot even marry anybody from that same village. They have to marry from some other villages. So many practices uh, related to marriage and so on and so forth, related to gender, related to religion, that are basic to the structure of the family. And culture also includes uh, the structure of institutions. It includes uh, religion, it includes food habits, it includes um, education, it includes justice, which express uh, or govern social relationships. Our relationships are governed by these institutions. It also means, culture also means the characteristic forms through which members of the society communicate. Culture also means the ways in which members of the society communicate. Clifford Geertz, who was a very famous uh, theorist who engaged with uh, history, defined culture as the ensemble of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Remember, uh, our grandmothers told us bedtime stories. We read the stories. There were stories told to us as part of religion. There were stories told to us as part of um, uh, education. Uh, and there were stories that formed our collective unconscious, so many stories, so many narratives of so many different uh, kinds that came to us in so many different ways. All these stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, some of these are meta-narratives, obviously, like um, a postmodernist would say. Some of these were meta-narratives. Some of these involved power. In fact, all of these involved power. All of, this in, all of these stories involved acculturation or conditioning. We were taught many things about ourselves through these stories. All this together, said Clifford, uh, Clifford Geertz, is what is called culture. All right, now, uh, culture 
is about rituals, like the Brahmins in South India uh, make um, drawings with rice powder in the courtyard. Uh, in North India, the same thing happens with Rangoli, with colored powders in certain times of the year, of course. In Kerala, uh, during Onam festival, we do the same thing with flowers. Culture is practices like this. Culture is also practices like this. Every week, uh, if there were no pandemic, we would have gone to some mall, we would have gone to the food court, we would have eaten at the food, uh, at the food court in the uh, you know, uh, multinational um, food outlets like KFC or McDonald's, for example. Mall culture, metro culture, urban culture, that is also culture. In, uh, for, for example, in, 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 a, in a metro school, in an in urban school, suppose there is a child who has never eaten a burger or a pizza, he would definitely be looked down upon by the others. What? You don't know what is pizza? You don't know what's a burger? Because eating a burger or a pizza or eating at KFC or McDonald's, etc., is kind of defining you. It gives you a certain social status. Like the Brahmins had a certain social status, their conventions, their rituals had a certain social status within uh, traditional communities. This brings us to the idea of high culture. In the 19th century, uh, in the Victorian period especially, there was a very uh, prominent divide, uh, significant divide between high culture and low culture. In the 19th century Europe, culture came to be associated with the elite people, the upper class people. And uh, the practices of the upper class were considered as superior to those of the lower classes. Why in the Victorian period did high culture become prominent? Because Victorian period is the time of industrial revolution. Victorian period is the time of the rise of the working class. When the rise of the working class happened, automatically the elite people held on to their culture, to their upper class culture. And they wanted to protect their uh, culture from political posturing or commercialization or vulgar vulgarity. They wanted to protect it from encroachments from working class culture. So high culture began to be defined as the culture of the community. There was a very big uh, move within Victorian society to preserve high culture, to promote high culture among the people and their fashions, the uh, fashions of the upper class, the lifestyle of the upper class, the entertainment practices, the professions of the upper class, all these began to be um, hierarchically considered superior to the uh, activities of the lower classes or the working classes. For example, look at these women. They are definitely elite upper class women. They are elite upper class women as you see from their clothing. This is Victorian clothing. As you see from their uh, activities, they are looking uh, through uh, the, the, the prototype of the binoculars. Uh, the, through, through the field glasses they are looking, uh, while lower class people or working class people would not spend their time like this. Certain other things that high culture people did, upper class people did, can you think of it? High culture people or upper class people did things like horse riding or hunting. Horse riding and hunting were very, very important uh, practices uh, within the elite class. For example, in the Victorian novel, Tests of the Devils, there is a very subtle dichotomy between farming and hunting. Have you noticed that? In Tests of the Devils, there is a very, very subtle dichotomy between farming, farming in two ways, farming as related to nature, farming as related to milk, milking and cows. That is what happens in Talbutes dairy. And also farming that is very harsh, related to drought, related to the fields where uh, later Tess is working like a punishment. That farm is called Flintcomb Ash. These two kinds of farming are juxtaposed with very subtly with hunting. Tess comes across uh, certain uh, pheasant birds that have been uh, killed by hunters. Some of them are uh, dying. Some of these pheasant birds are dying and uh, Tess very kindly, very lovingly wrings their necks and puts them to death so that they are saved from the trauma of dying. 
Why is this important? Because Tess herself is being hunted by Alec. This subtle reference is there in the novel. Tess herself is being hunted by Alec. So hunting as an elite practice, Alec can hunt, but Tess will not hunt. Tess is the farming girl. Did you understand? F hunting um, as uh, against farming, that is what you see in Tess. While high class culture, higher class culture versus lower class culture is there in other Victorian novels such as Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre's activities, her clothing, her lifestyle is consciously and professedly lower class as against the clothing and activities of uh, uh, the other woman whom um, uh, Rochester is going to marry, Blanche Ingram. Blanche Ingram is more like these women, highly, uh, highly well-dressed and just lounging and uh, uh, engaged in uh, flirtatious conversations, witty conversations with men, uh, with uh, up upper-class pastimes, while people like uh, Jane are engaged in other kinds of activities that show their lower-class status. So this high culture versus low culture is subtly there as a presence in many Victorian novels. I just wanted uh, you to, uh, I just wanted to bring uh, this to your attention. High class as also represented in balls, as you see in Madame Bovary of all novels. Madame Bovary attends the ball at Vaubissard and she can never get over it. She is enamored of high class life. She is so much in love with that elite existence, that quali quality life of the upper classes that she falls into immorality and debt and she has to uh, sacrifice her life for her dreams. This concept of ball, another uh, Victorian novel that where ball uh, or dancing or balls is very, very important is uh, Pride and Prejudice. Another is uh, a little uh, before this, Rape of the Lock. It is not a novel, it is a mock epic. So in these uh, literary works, high culture is presented as covetous, as uh, symptomatic or uh, representative of upper class values that uh, are highly sought after in the society, as against lower class culture or working class culture, which is represented as domestic chores. Look at their clothing that is plain. They are washing in the company of other women and children, they are sewing. Washing and sewing are working class activities. It is always the governesses and the servants who are sewing. It is uh, the seamstress Grace Poole who is sewing. So lower class culture as markedly different from high class culture as also the carnival or street culture. The carnivalesque or the street culture uh, also is against higher class culture. So these are the ways in which subtly um, uh, literature also represents the dichotomy of cultures presenting one kind of culture as superior over the other. When Michel, uh, sorry, Mikhail Bakhtin talks about the carnivalesque, it is the resistance of the ordinary and the everyday and the lower class against the tyranny of the upper class. That is the importance of the carnivalesque. That is the importance of the carnivalesque. And the, the carnivalesque is where all people, irrespective of their wealth or social status, they are equalized. And uh, in the now, I was talking about the Victorian society. It is in the Victorian period that high culture is so superior. High, uh, I did not tell you one thing. I have divided these two days into one day that, that is today a discussion of culture in general, and tomorrow I will be talking about the theory of cultural studies in terms of the theorists and the uh, terms. Okay, uh, today I want to have a general discussion on culture so that a oh, lot of ideas. Uh, related to cultural studies, a lot of concepts and ideas related to cultural studies would sink deep into you so that it will help you to analyze uh, literary works or cultural events, etc., in your research projects and papers. Now, in the Victorian period, uh, you know that there was a beginning of the suffragette movement. Not only women, but working class people, ordinary people also fought for their vo voting rights. Universal voting rights was a very important issue at that time. 
surprisingly a lot of uh, very major thinkers and theorists of the time including our Matthew Arnold and Thomas Carlyle were against universal voting rights. They did not support the working class people getting the right to vote. Look at the representations of universal voting rights here. Ordinary working class people getting their votes this is a very famous uh, picture and women getting their votes and also black men getting their votes. That is also very significant at this time. Black men casting votes. Obviously this is from America. These are very important pictures. I, we, we talk about iconography or representation of um, you know, certain events or values, et cetera, in icons or in pictures. So imaging and iconography come under the purview of cultural studies. How were the suffragettes um, or the people who fought for universal voting rights represented in paintings and photographs and movies and um, newspaper uh, images, media images, and also in literature. All that comes under the purview of cultural studies. Cultural studies values. Now, let me give you, with this introduction, let me go a little bit into cultural studies. Cultural studies uh, is not on the side of high culture. Cultural studies value working class culture and popular culture. It is on the side of the margins. Cultural studies understands. You can say cultural studies understand singular or as plural. You can take it as one or two or, or multiple. Uh, here I'm taking it as one entity. Cultural studies understands that what is considered universal or natural culture is actually rooted in power relations. Culture studies understands that what is considered universal or natural, that is universal. For example, heterosexuality is universal. People were thinking until recently. Did you understand? Uh, you know, people uh, that rich people should be the rulers. They are the powerful people. They are the people who know everything. That is obvious. That is also considered a universal um, aspect of culture. There are universal cultural uh, elements pertaining to gender roles. Isn't it natural that women should be subordinated to men? Isn't it normal and natural that women should be cooking and cleaning and doing all the chores in the house and serving the family and sacrificing their needs for the family? Isn't it natural? Isn't it normal? What is there to question? Like this, so many ideas or notions have been naturalized, mythologized, to use a term from Roland Barr. A lot of ideas have been normalized, naturalized, mythologized. We accept them, we take them for granted without questioning them. Many ideas related to gender like that, many ideas related to marriage. Isn't it nor, you know, every young person who is conditioned by the society thinks, I want to get married, I want a family. Family is my ultimate fulfillment. Only if I have family, I will have meaning in my life. Well, you may or may not feel that, but definitely, a certain high percentage of this feeling comes from conditioning. It is not natural that people are born with the urge to create children and, um, you know, you might want a partner, but marriage is a different thing. Marriage is a different thing. Marriage is an institution. Nobody has a natural urge for marriage. People have a natural urge to have sex. People have a natural urge to uh, share their ha happiness and joy with another human being. That is called a partner. That is not necessarily called a wife who has to do the cleaning and cooking and uh, bringing up the children and all these things on her own. Did you understand? So the institutionalization of marriage is a cultural process. It is not natural, but we make it look like it is natural. So there are so many ideas related to gender, marriage, even music, so many ideas related to music. For example, very um, melodious, organized, uh, harmonious music is in all cultures considered superior to music that is uh, disruptive and disorganized and like this. Did you understand what I'm saying? Music that is disorganized is considered pop or lower class or working class, whereas organized 
melodious, harmonious music is classical music. That is upper class music, that is why. Because orchestra, musical instruments, these were afforded only by the rich people. They need rehearse. Classical music became upper class or elite because of these social reasons. And also because of its power-centered relation with religion. Because it sold the commodity of religion or God. God as a neutral objective entity is a wonderful idea. But God as institutionalized by a religion. God as wearing certain clothes, looking in a certain way. God as preaching only certain ideas. God as uh, leading us to protect our religion and fight other religions. That is institutionalization. That God is a cultural construct. And that God is carried by the medium of music. Those, so there is a power relation uh, in the canonization of uh, Western or, or, or any classical music and in the marginalization of pop and folk and disruptive kinds of music. But the disruptive marginal kinds of music or dance or any art for that matter, anti-art you can call it, they have made their presence felt. They're, they have questioned the centers at several times in history. They have made the, the people from the margins have used art to make their voices heard. That is also true. Power does not move in one direction from, as Michel Foucault said, from the center to the margins all the time. No, power works everywhere. Power is there in the margins also. So uh, there is power at work in the concept of music and in the concept of universalization of music. Did you understand? There is universe, uh, normalization or universalization in food, as I've already said. Certain foods, like in some communities, vegetarian food, in some communities, chicken, in some communities, Western food, et cetera, et cetera, become normal, universal. Those who do not have this are like aberrations. And those who eat other foods are also uh, the enemies. They are the other. So food is also tyrannical, oppressive. Sports also, sports. For the first time in my life, when I was preparing for this lecture, I realized that there is so much uh, of the hierarchization or, a, uh, you know, I, I always knew it, but I never really realized it or taught it. There is a, a canonization of elite upper class aristocratic culture in, for example, Mac Flecknoe. Mac Flecknoe makes fun of inferior sports in Dunciad also. Inferior, filthy sports, especially in Dunciad, more than in Mac Flecknoe. Uh, inferior filthy sports are all rele relegated to the margins, to the working classes, to the, they are the bad people, the villains, you know, the farmers or the working classes or the marginal peoples are the villains. Etymologically, villain meant farmer. So what is high class culture? What is high sport? What is high music? That is always inherently there in literature and art. The defining or canonization of great traditions in art and literature and culture as against the base, the pop, the folk, the marginal. That is inherently there in culture. So cultural studies understands that what is considered universal or natural culture is actually rooted in power relations. And cultural studies understands that we homogenize and naturalize culture by marginalizing other elements of culture. Culture studies was pioneered by this man. All of you know him, I'm sure, Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams, uh, Richard Hogarth and E.P. Uh, Thompson, they were the pioneers of cultural studies. Cultural studies uh, started in the CCCS uh, or the uh, Center for Cultural Studies, Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham in England, in UK. Now, before I go on to talk about the beginnings of cultural studies, I want to talk about the main, uh, the, the concerns of cultural studies in a more organized manner. So what is cultural studies about? That is what this section is going to deal with. What is cultural studies about? It is an interdisciplinary study. 
as I already showed you, cultural studies is about history. It's about economics. It's about art. It's about literature. It's about sociology. It is about how culture relates to the larger society. Cultural studies is about how culture relates to the larger society, the political dynamics of mass media and everyday cultural practices. That is what cultural studies is about. The political dynamics of mass media. Don't take for granted TV or the movies. There is a power working through the TV and the movies, through music, through entertainment media, through cultural industry. There is a political dynamics at work on you. There is a political dynamics in everyday cultural practices. Cultural studies is about how culture transforms individual experiences, social realities, and power relations. How culture transforms individual experiences. Our individual experiences are not our own. They are belonging to the larger cultural entity of which we are part. Our individual experiences are uh, conditioned and shaped. Our social realities are constructed. Our relations with our family members or friends or teachers and students or whatever is all conditioned, transformed, uh, constructed by cultural practices. Cultural studies looks at how this happens. Cultural studies draws on social theory, philosophy, history, linguistics, media. And what are the main features of cultural studies? Cultural studies examine cultural practices in terms of their relation to power. How cultural practices are related to power. I told you a little bit of that already, but I'm coming to it more in the coming slides. Cultural studies deal with culture in all its complexity. Cultural studies understands that culture is not a linear thing. The upper class people, uh, they are, their culture is the norm. Their culture, they are propagating. Everybody else is trying to be upper class, trying to follow the upper class. That is not, that is not how culture works. Culture is more complex than that. Cultural studies deal with culture in all its complexity within its socio-political context. You take the socio-political context and how culture in a complicated manner works there in that context. It is not a one linear relation. Culture is a network. Culture works in so many complicated ways within the socio-political context. Cultural studies looks at how these complexities of culture works. Did you understand? Cultural studies involve theory and praxis or practice. Cultural studies involve theory. What do you mean by that? Theory of culture as an object of study. Oh, this is culture. The cell phone culture. Culture studies is looking at theory of culture as an object of study. Technology as culture, techno culture. Culture becomes an object of study as well as it is a practice. Means culture as a location of political criticism and action. Culture is a location of political criticism. We have social media culture, for example. We have social media culture. Many revolutions these days have taken shape in the social media. The social media uh, uh, you know, led to a networking of people, sharing of ideas. Many people protested against various forms of oppression as a result of social media culture. And the social media culture, for example, can be studies as, studied as a location of political criticism. How political criticism emerges as an action, as a practice in social media. That can also be the, uh, the, the objective of cultural studies. Cultural studies is based on both knowledge as subjective experience and knowledge as objective and universal. Cultural studies looks at knowledge as subjective as one individual's subjective experience. Also, knowledge as objective and universal. Cultural studies is about knowledge. When I say knowledge, 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 
Several times, many of you have already thought about Michel Foucault and the relationship that he drew between power and knowledge. Knowledge is not an innocent thing, whether it is subjective or objective, knowledge is about power. We will come to that also. Cultural studies attempt to evaluate and change. Cultural studies is not just one theory. That is how cultural studies is different from traditional literary theory. Traditional literary theory would sit in its armchair and talk about what is happening there. Cultural studies would leave the armchair, go into what is happening there and probably change it. Cultural studies is about not only evaluation, but also change. It seeks to evaluate and change structures of dominance, especially in industrial and capitalist societies. In industrial and capitalist societies, cultural studies seek to change structures of dominance. I am drawing your attention to this. Cultural studies is deeply rooted in Marxism because cultural studies drew from two Marxist schools, that is Frankfurt School and the New Left. Cultural studies is against capitalism. It is against industrial capitalist societies. Cultural studies in a very, with a Marxist fervor seeks to change structures of dominance within industrial capitalist societies. Did you understand? I have highlighted the important keywords in red here. Now, what are the basic assumptions in cultural studies? Cultural studies believes that culture is not one monolithic entity. It is not a preconceived notion. For example, it is not that Indian culture is already there and we are born into it. No, not like that. It is not like Indian culture is already there and we are born into it. No, it is not like American culture is already there and we are entering it. No, culture is a changing thing. Culture is a provisional entity. It is constituted by signs organized as codes. Culture is constituted by signs organized as codes. For example, we um, test conducted a test fluid classroom exhibition on literary theory a couple of years ago. Fluid classroom exhibition on literary theory. One exhibit there was uh, based on culture and gender. There was a picture of me wearing a shirt and uh, dhoti which is the um, dress of men in Kerala. I was wearing a dress and dhoti. I, one day I went to uh, class and taught in those clothes also. There was also the picture of my friend, a man wearing a sari. Did you understand what I mean? I'm wearing men's clothes. All of us wear jeans and uh, shirts that have become like unisex clothes, women's clothes. Once upon a time, I remember when I was in school, I told my mother, uh, please buy me jeans and a shirt. She said, no, that is not what a girl should wear. You're not going to get it. You're not going to wear it. She said that. So there was a time when jeans and shirt were not worn by women in India, as you all know. So our clothes, which is part of culture, is not uh, an innocent objective entity. It is organized as codes. Means it brings a lot of meanings. It is like a signifier. When I wear jeans and shirt, when I wear jeans and shirt now, it will look like, oh, she is modern. She is metropolitan. She is not rustic. Even rustic or village people wear jeans and shirt these days in India. When I wore jeans and shirt uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, if I wore jeans and shirt 35 years ago, she is feminist. She is not a good girl. We don't want to uh, marry her. We don't want to deal with her. You know, that kind of image, the same dress had in those days. So, when a woman wears a sari, when I wear this sari and sit here, you said, ma'am, you look good. Had I been a man, suppose you had a male uh, lecturer and he came wearing a sari, what would it mean? So culture 
is not an objective, innocent uh, entity with permanent meanings. Culture is constituted by signs organized as codes. Cultural signs involve representation and othering. My friend, the man who wore uh, a sari and put his picture on Facebook is an LGBTIQ activist. Now it makes sense. Now it makes sense why he wore a sari. But a man who is married with a wife and children, obviously heterosexual, running a heterosexual family, would he wear a sari and walk about? Did you understand? So the clothes that a man with a wife and children will wear represent his sexual orientation and uh, gender preferences. While my friend who wore a sari represented his LGBTIQ identity by wearing that costume. Cultural signs involve representation. Cultural signs also involve othering. Like women who wear jeans or leggings are even today uh, being attacked. There were men who were saying that women are raped because they wear jeans and leggings. Did you understand? Because women are uh, according to patriarchy, defined by certain clothes. Clothes is only one example. Clothes is only one example. I just uh, scratched my arm and I suddenly realized that I have a tattoo. This tattoo that I, I, I made on my arm has changed my identity for the good as well as for the worse. I have had so many wonderful as well as challenging experiences after I posted my picture on Facebook with this tattoo. Why? Because this tattoo is not just a tattoo. It is a signifier. Today, tattoo would mean a liberated woman and so on and so forth. In my grandmother's time, a tattoo would mean that I belong to certain uh, gypsy class. You know, in our community, the gypsies, people who walked about selling things, etc., they had tattoos. They, th there, were, there were tattoos then also but it de defined uh, a certain other identity. I am realizing the, the, the depth of this uh, cultural signs as codes because of my tattoo. So culture is not a single thing. It is a multifarious, uh, complicated uh, process. Culture is discursive. It includes conflicts involving structures of knowledge and power. The diverse cultural forms and practices should all be studied according to cultural studies. There is nothing that you can leave out in culture. When I was a student uh, 25 years ago in college, um, some of my friends were going to study uh, cricket as symptomatic of Indian identity. One of my uh, senior, uh, uh, who's now a professor, one, one of my seniors in college, who's now a professor was studying ice hockey as a marker of Canadian identity. Ice hockey as a marker of Canadian identity. I myself was studying children's films. There were so many people in those days. We were all pioneers in cultural studies research in those days, I suppose. Uh, but there were so many traditional professors and traditionalists, purists, who were telling us, don't do all these things, study only literature. Because traditionally, we thought all these various forms of culture should not be studied. Popular culture should not be studied. Comics should not be studied. They are not literature. Literature is the canonical texts that have certain values. But Today, cultural studies have broken up the boundaries of literary departments, and we study diversity of cultural forms and practices. And we also study how different groups or classes compete for cultural domination. Because in all this, there is cultural domination at work. The focus is on how culture is practiced and how culture is produced or made. When I made a tattoo on my arm, when I got a tattoo made on my arm, I was producing culture. I, I am in the process. When I did uh, research in children's films, then also I was producing culture. Every time you do something related to culture, you're producing culture. Our culture is being made. It is being propagated in these ways. The focus is on that. So let me first talk about this one issue of power. 
Look at that gesture of Donald Trump that shows power. And he does stand for power. You know how Trump had a very um, power centric stance towards the Mexicans and the immigrants in America. Cultural studies is concerned with the marginalized communities within a nation. Cultural studies is uh, concerned with the disadvantaged people, the silenced margins and their perspectives. Trump's action reminds us like the uh, military, uh, the, 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 the French, the Negro boy, young Negro saluting in a uh, French military uniform, that picture that came in Paris match that Roland Bath talked about. Roland Bath famously talked about a picture that came on the magazine Paris Match, where a young Negro is saluting with his eyes uplifted. He's probably looking at the French flag because he's wearing French military uniform. And this picture actually normalizes French democracy. Look at this, even a Negro is saluting the French flag. French democracy is there. France is not oppressing uh, the Negroes. If France is ruling the Negroes, that's okay. The Negroes want it. Like this, democracy is naturalized by this image. Like that. I'm reminded of that picture because like that, Trump pointing like this. We are not seeing Trump here in cultural studies perspective. We are seeing what is at the other end of his pointing. What is at the other end of his finger? The Mexicans, the immigrants, the Africans, the Afro-Americans the marginalized people in the nation, the dispossessed, silenced margins in the nation, the oppressed margins in the nation. That is what power is about. Culture studies is about. It looks at how power works on these people. In a Foucauldian sense, if you think of Michel Foucault, cultural studies understands power and its relationship with knowledge as constituting individuals. Power is there in me. I am made of power relations. The power relations pertaining to my class, my caste, my gender, my religion, my region. I'm a South Indian. Did you understand? I had a lot of struggle uh, as a woman, as a South Indian, as a wife and mother to build my tests and my career. My identity is wrought with power relations. Because I am a woman, I was at an advantage. At the same time, I was at a disadvantage. Because I'm a South Indian, I was at an advantage. Also, I was at a huge disadvantage. Even now, majority of people in North India do not believe that I'm a good teacher. I'm still struggling as a businesswoman to uh, reach out to them. Had I been born in Lucknow or Delhi or one of the power centers in the north, the story would have been different. Many people advise me, move to the north, start a center there for this reason. So every one of us, I've just used my personal example, every one of us is existing. Our identity is in a matrix of power relations that are related to knowledge. It constitutes us. How our knowledge constitutes us and our communities. You know, our knowledges are not simple things. Starting from the question, oh, Kalyani, you are such a, a busy professional. Do you know cooking? Can you cook anything? So many times I've been asked. If I had been a housewife, people may not have asked me this question so much. I'm not a bad cook. I, I am a good cook, even though I do not cook every day or I do not cook everything. Because I'm a businesswoman, what, what makes it essential that I may not be a good cook? Not necessary. I could be a good cook as well. But there is a power in that question. You are not doing your feminine duties as a cook and a housekeeper and a mother and wife. You're, you're a career woman. So there is a power uh, underlying that question. Can you cook anything? Do you know how to make any food item, you know? So uh, our uh, identity exists within such 
social power relations. Cultural studies explore how power works on us and finds expression in such representations. Now, uh, uh, all of you may not be aware of what Foucault said about uh, power knowledge. Power exists in capillary formations. It's everywhere in the system. And power is coexisting with knowledge. As an example, Foucault gave famously the, uh, the practice of confession, starting from the 18th century or so. The Catholic Church or the Church, okay, Protestant also, promoted the practice of confession. And Michel Foucault noted that, it was in the history of sexuality that he talked about confession. He noted that confession is the main ritual that Western societies rely on for the production of truth. Confession is the main ritual with which we uh, produce truth. Now, what do you mean by that? What is confession in a church? You have committed sins in your life. You have to go and tell the truth to the priest. You have to confess the truth to the priest. That is what Stephen Daedalus does in a portrait of the artist as a young man. People are forced by the church, then by the police, then by the teacher, then by the, also the family, and so on and so forth. In all these social institutions, people are forced to tell the truth within double quotes. People are forced to tell the truth, mostly about their sexual activities. How many of you women have not heard this, especially uh, women of the previous uh, generation? How many of you have not heard it from their parents? Who were you with? Why did you talk to the boy? Why did you go out without telling me? Most women here would have heard it, this question, especially if they are from India. Why? Because of the concern that the society have about the chastity, the morality, the character of women, especially pertaining to their sexual activities. So, Confession centers mostly on sexual activities, and it is uh, inherent in the practices of the church, the court, education, family, medicine, medicine. If you have uh, gone to a gynecologist or a psychiatrist with very intimate problems, with very, um, you know, uh, with problems that you can't share with everybody, that kind of problems you will understand. And Michel Foucault famously said that Western man has become a confessing animal. Western man has become a confessing animal. In my career as a teacher, even without my asking anybody, any of my students, I don't know how many students have come and confessed to me. <laughs> because it's a practice. We are also Western like them now. Ma'am, I want to talk to you. Here comes confession. Yes, talk to me. I'm listening. Ma'am, I have these family problems or I'm not able to study well. Ma'am, I did not uh, read any book or anything uh, in the past, but now I want to pass this exam <laughs> like that. On and off, people will come and confess all their sins to me, educational sins to me. Because I'm a teacher, it is inherent. We can't survive without confessing, it seems. And Michel Foucault says that confessing has become, or truth, this pursuit of truth, confession as a, you should confess, you should open your heart to other people. This is a commonly accepted thing. You should have a friend, you should have friends, you should share your uh, problems with other people. Why on earth would you want to talk to other people? I don't understand. <laughs> Michel Foucault also wouldn't understand. You don't have. Uh, to necessarily say all your deepest secrets to anybody. You can keep some deep, deepest secrets without telling anybody also. Michel Foucault says, we no longer realize, we no longer perceive or realize that this confession or the centrality we give to truth is actually the effect of disciplinary power on our psyche. Disciplinary power on our psyche. Are you doing the right thing? You have to talk to somebody in order to check whether you're doing the right thing. You know, this is all about good and evil, right and wrong. This is about what is accepted and not, what is permissible and not. 
in certain communities it would also come to sorry priest i ate beef today which is not permissible in my community sorry priest i had these thoughts about my uh, cousin which is not permissible in my community you know things like that things that are accepted in other communities because they are not permissible in your community will become evil or sin so michel foucault says that we do not any more realize how much we are oppressed by this practice of confession how through the practice of confession dominant ideologies are actually subjugating us to their disciplinary power in this context it would be very interesting to talk about or think about the role of confession in autobiographies as you know autobiography itself is a confession confessions is the title of many autobiographies like those of saint augustine or uh, jean jacques rousseau why do we have to write autobiographies and when we write autobiographies how far do we tell the truth how far is it necessary to tell the truth is there a truth you know breaking free from the boundaries of uh, traditional autobiography we have writers like maya angelo who wrote not one but many autobiographies we have uh, writers who have contradicted themselves in their autobiographies also so the, the the very issue of autobiography writing could be interesting in the context of michel foucault's power knowledge and example of confession right i waxed a little too eloquent about all that now the next is identity we are all aware that we are looking at uh, the picture of malala yousafzai in this slide identity is a very important issue in cultural studies cultural studies understands that identities are constructed within discourses identities are not given we are not born with an identity it is not that i was born kalyani vallath you know my name kalyani vallath gives me an identity kalyani in kerala is used to be usually not now but like 5 6 years ago only old women not 5 uh, 10 20 years ago 20 years ago only old women were called kalyani young girls are today called kalyani but when i started teaching many fathers and mothers of my students would say on the phone they would call me ma'am ma we wanted to ask you about your course i said yes this is the, these are the details and then they will say where did you retire from ma'am see i was 20 years younger at that time 20 but 23 years younger i said i did not retire from anywhere i i only starting to teach they will say oh my god we heard the name kalyani and we thought you must be retired many times i have heard this my name kalyani gives me a certain identity with regard to my age they think i am old they give me an identity re re related to religion probably caste also you know that some names are common in some castes and other names are common in other castes uh, you know when you when i when i wanted to name my son hariharan my, some of my relatives said no don't Uh, put uh, use that no don't give him that name because that doesn't show our caste it shows uh, bram uh, tamil brahmins or something <laughs> you know it shows some other caste so don't give that name people have said that so identity is constructed by our religion our name our caste our region for many people uh, across india kalyani would be mallu kalyani would be mallu did you understand that is an identity so identity culture studies understands that identity is a construct and it is constructed through discourses through processes of power and negotiation identity can be both personal as well as collective identity means a sense of uniqueness as distinct from others a sense of uniqueness of a person or a community as different from others identity also means a sense of belonging to others my people that identity they we and them us and them this dichotomy is created using uh, these identity markers such as names identity means belonging to a certain group many people put the name of their caste as part of their name why to show we belong to that group 
that is a sense of belonging that is seen by that name that surname identity as shaping one's values beliefs knowledges it studies for example dr kalyani valad that doctor in my name is valuable it shows my identity it shows my values beliefs knowledges it studies the ways in which cultural studies uh, is about the ways in which racial sexual ethnic communal identities got constructed for example take the example of malala what is the identity of malala it is deeply connected with her gender a girl she was a young girl that is what touched our hearts another identity she is a muslim a muslim activist is much more covetable than a european christian activist you know it's more much more revolutionary than it is normal for european christians to be rebels among women but for muslim women from pakistan or afghanistan it's not easy so she is a muslim uh, that is another identity that made up that another marker that made up her identity and that she fought against taliban that political issue had she been an indian muslim it wouldn't have been so uh, attractive but she fought against the taliban that is what that political involvement that political um, element gave value to her identity a cultural studies approach to the identity of uh, malala and her autobiography how would you uh, approach malala from the cultural studies perspective by in the, by examining the intersections of the institutions of gender culture education religion politics the discourse of violence had the taliban not shot on her we wouldn't have appreciated her so much would would we have that's a very cruel thing to say but we she is so valuable to us because the taliban shot her that violence also defines her identity you know when there is a political uh, riot etc happening some corrupt politicians might want themselves to be you know uh, beaten or uh, injured i'm just imagining some corrupt corrupt politicians will get other people to injure them so that they will get more sympathy did you understand because that politics of violence that discourse of violence has uh a meaning behind it culture studies is about that also i don't know if you are bored i'm going on and on and on it is one and a, uh one and 20 one hour and 20 minutes this uh discussion has to go on for two hours uh feel free to uh, refresh yourselves to eat something you can have your dinner um you can get up and walk about please feel free i'm going on and on and on and uh you don't have the opportunity to talk to me also because i said mute your mics let me talk because there is so much to cover that's why so a cultural studies approach uh, would also involve looking at how the west constructed the images or identity of the orient how the identity of the orient was constructed through photographs through orientalist paintings through uh, cultural events like the great exhibition of london through colonial literature how were orientalist images or identities constructed how did heart of darkness construct an orientalist identity of africa that would be a cultural studies approach that would be a concern of cultural studies let me give you a more concrete example take the case of white tiger by arvind adiga recently it was a movie uh, it has been made into a movie so many of you might have watched it or read the book arvind adiga's white tiger is about a very lower class worker balram halwai he is from a very poor background a deprived background by killing his master and uh, using a lot of uh, unacceptable activities but through a lot of unacceptable activities he became rich he became an entrepreneur he is running a taxi company and he is writing a letter to the prime minister of china when jia bao and what is this novel about this novel is about how balram forged his individual identity 
and rose above the rooster coop of india that is what he calls india the rooster coop like all we are all chickens inside one box we are all like that chickens inside a box and balram halwa alone is flying up this from a cultural studies perspective the white tiger is about how balram halwa forged an individual identity and rose above the rooster coop of india it's a satire about the rooster coop of india it's a satire on india and that would be a cultural studies perspective now next ideology ideology i have put uh, the picture of the proposed ram 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 mandir here ideology is a set of beliefs attitudes of a certain people you know some every one of us belong to some community or the other we all have ideologies none of these ideologies is right or wrong but some are more dominant over the others you can't deny that none of these is right or wrong but some are more dominant cultural studies holds that ideology is the most powerful tool in politics we can see that happening in many countries ideology is the most powerful tool in politics in america in saudi arabia in india in pakistan and afghanistan you can see in iran iraq in many european countries ideology is the way in which it is through ideology that politics works what do you mean by politics how the ruling classes rule over the powerless masses how the ruling classes infiltrate their ideology into the minds of the masses thereby dominating them in other words the ruling class imposes its ideology on the entire society a deconstructionist reading of the aryan text now that i'm i'm talking about uh, i i i have shown you the picture of ram kshetra ram ram mandir as a, an example let me also take a, a deconstructionist view of aryan text like mahabharata or ramayana and as a south indian if i do a uh, uh, what is it called a uh, uh, dravidian reading if if i take a dravidian reading of the aryan text these texts would be like how the aryan ideology is the ruling class ideology that is the north indian ideology and that how that ideology uh, infiltrated into the rest of india these debates and discussions have gone on since the time of india's independence how the ruling class uh, dominates over the other classes using ideology this comes under the purview of cultural studies ruling class ideology covers up when you think at large anywhere in the world whatever politics or religion or community we are talking about ruling class ideology will dominate and ruling class ideology will hide exploitation ruling class ideology covers up for the exploitation and the unequal power relations that exist between uh, people and social classes within the nation ruling class ideology will dominate and it will cover up the unequal social relations also religious and cultural actions uh, become expressions of certain ideologies our social political religious cultural actions become uh, representations of certain ideologies for example Uh, when i wear these clothes and come and sit in front of you i am definitely showing my uh, indian ideology patriarchal ideology uh, le leave india leave uh, things that hurt us take a text like frankenstein or um, wuthering heights for example take a text like frankenstein or wuthering heights all of you are familiar with these texts when you read frankenstein or wuthering heights from a cultural studies perspective it would reveal the inherent class structure in the narrative there is the inherent class structure in the narrative at work the bourgeois or upper class ideology of victor frankenstein or the earnshaws at work and it is oppressing frankenstein's monster and heathcliff and also frankenstein's monster and heathcliff are rebelling against it they are exerting their power against it also 
So when you read from the cultural studies perspective, a text like Wuthering Heights of Frankenstein, you are looking at how the bourgeois values are imposed on the characters like Heathcliff or the monster and how they seek to rebel against these values. So that is how cultural studies engages with ideology. Next is the concept of uh, modernity. Next, I have to talk to you about the concept of modernity. Here you see missionaries, Christian missionaries and uh, African converts. That is the picture that I have given here. That would remind you that modernity that came with uh, colonization or colonialism was inextricably bound with Christianity. The term modernity was uh, originally associated with Christianity and evangelical efforts. Christianity as the present, remember the first timeline that I showed, Christianity at the end, at the end of the evolution, Christianity as the present, as against a pagan past. When the European colonizers looked at Asia or Africa, they, look, they were looking at the past. They wanted to reform the past. They wanted to reform the pagan past and uh, replace it with a Christian present. And they saw Christianity as simultaneous with the rise of science and capitalism. The virtues of science and capitalism, they saw as simultaneous with Christianity as development. For the colonizers, Christianity, capitalism, science, all these things meant development. So col colonialism, Christianity, uh, capitalism, all these were associated with ideas like progress and development, which were covetable. People wanted it, progress and development. However, however, under the purview of cultural studies, progress and development are looked upon with suspicion. They are looked upon as exploitative socioeconomic modes of development. We don't, in cultural studies, we don't uh, embrace the ideas of progress and development as much as we did in the time of modernity. Cultural studies is aware that modernity is closely associated with slave trade and colonialism. That is why, uh, Theorists have said that the, the, the project of modernity is never complete. Modernity is not a, a monolithic and a perfect thing. Modernity has created more problems than it's solved. Modernity went hand in hand with slave trade and colonialism and the beginnings of globalization. Even though globalization is a 1990s phenomenon, it started with colonial trade the expansion of trade all over the globe. We should be aware that modernity also resulted in the homogenization of culture. The Christian missionaries and the colonizers wanted us to be a class of Indians who would speak their language, who would think like them, speak like them, live like them. Remember what Macaulay said? They wanted to homogenize us. They wanted uh, us all to look the same, speak the same, think the same, same like them. They wanted to wipe out our differences. They wanted to wipe out our uh, knowledges, our traditions, and replace it with a false uh, replacement, which is their language, their culture, which can never be completely ours. We are still struggling to speak English. Even after so many years of independence, we are still struggling to speak English. That is an ambivalent thing. We still want to be like them. We, we still want to speak like them, which is unnecessary. Secondly, we can never be like them, which is also unnecessary. We are still struggling. We are still second language speakers of English. We are never going to be native speakers of English, are we? So colonialism, modernity homogenized us. It resulted in the formation of prisons, hospitals, mental asylums, all the things that Foucault talked about. Whether it's schools, prisons, they are all in the same, you know, plane. Prison, hospital, mental asylum, school. They standardized modernity, standardized taste and manners. Modernity standardized taste and manners for which they created the canon in literature. 
Remember Matthew Arnold desperately tried to teach us the standardized taste, the best that is known and taught in the world. That is what Matthew Arnold wanted to teach us. A critic should talk to us about the best that is known and taught in the world. F.R. Lewis wanted to teach us great tradition. T.S. Eliot said the function of criticism is elucidation of works of art and the correction of taste. All our tastes should be corrected and standardized. That is what T.S. Eliot wanted. So there was a standardization uh, behind modernity. In my convent school, where I studied, there was a standardization. Everybody looks the same in the same uniform, the same hairdress, the same ideas, the same thoughts. Standardization of education was essential for our modernity and our nationalism. After independence, the government gave a lot of importance to standardized education because only if we all have the same knowledges and we think alike and we, we are deprived of our creativity and individuality, only then we will be obeying, conforming citizens of the country. Nationalism was oppressing us. Because if we had been given freedom to think, creativity to do what we want, we would have rebelled, we would have questioned. So modernity is about standardization, which was the standardization of taste and manners in culture and literature, the standardization of mental uh, well-being, of normality, as ensured by prisons, lunatic asylums, uh, educational institutions, um, you know, etc., hospitals, etc. The coming of modernity. Today we understand created havoc in the society. So in post-colonialism and cultural studies, we understand that modernity just did, just did not simply bring everything that is good. Modernity created havoc in our societies. It tore our so traditional societies apart. Chinu Achubi has written about it in his novels. In his novels, like Things Fall Apart, what has Chinu Achubi written? He has written about how Christianity and modernity destroyed traditional culture. It led to a, a very a man of great integrity like Okongo, despite all his faults, he was a great man. He had to commit suicide. And he was pushed into oblivion. His great grandson, uh, his grandson, uh, Obi Okongo, took bribes. What's happening in the society? God is dead and we have killed him. You know, in a way, things fall apart. Center cannot hold. God is dead and we have killed him. Modernity came and replaced all that is good and enduring. What happened in Africa? Africa was a very naturally surviving uh, continent. The peoples in Africa shared and they, they were naturally friends. Some of them, they were naturally enemies, others. Africa is left in perpetual civil war because of the unnatural national boundaries and the unnatural uh, cultural divisions that colonialism created for them. Why is India fighting with Pakistan? People of Pakistan are not uh, bad people. Like we Indians, there are good and bad people everywhere. All the ordinary people in Pakistan are not against Indians. There are wonderful people I have met in real in Canada and Qatar, and there are wonderful Pakistanis I have met uh, online. They are like Indians. A lot of us have violent thoughts. A lot of us do not have. There are uh, all kinds of people in every country. Why are we fighting? Because of colonialism. Because the British left these two countries in such a way that, you know, divide and rule. The policy of the British was to keep us fighting forever, even after they go, so that they will benefit from our fighting, you know, even after our independence. So this is how uh, colonialism or modernity has divided us, created havoc in our societies. Think of early Indian novels like Kamala Markandeya's Nectar in a Sieve or Bhabani Bhattacharya's uh, A Handful of Rice. It shows modernity there also. The traditional village versus the modern city. 
that is the dichotomy in these novels early indian novels to take two examples nectar in a sieve and a handful of rice the urban rural divide where the city that stands for modernity is evil so all these uh, issues all these discussions come under the purview of cultural studies cultural studies is not only about uh, gender uh, you know uh, alternative genders or about contemporary media culture studies has intersections with post colonialism has intersections with post modernism but culture studies is different also culture studies is also about post modernity and globalization in what way post modernity began in the post industrial period in europe first industrial revolution happened at the end of the 19th century and then the post industrial societies were formed in the post industrial societies itself along with modernism post modernism began along with modernity post modernity dawned in europe and america both and it signaled the rise of massive information and communications technologies you know the from the invention of the telephone where you can communicate with people from uh, over long distances the invention of the television where you can mediate reality and control people's knowledge and ideas this was seen for the first time in america uh, at the time of the assassination of john f kennedy the first massive event to be televised and mediated was the assassination of john f kennedy in the 1960s the vietnam war after that the gulf war and how the mass media communications technologies defined and controlled and manipulated our knowledge our realities that is what cultural studies is about cultural mm -hmm. studies is about how postmodernity and its fragmented production processes which lead to globalization you know it started in the time of colonialism itself my mother sorry my grandmother had a a brahmin father who occasionally visited the family once in a while he was very rich my grandmother's nayar uh, mother was very poor and her brahmin father occasionally visited and when he died very young he left nothing for the family except for some imported pieces of clothing my grandmother until her death used to keep a piece of linen sorry muslin a piece of muslin a piece of flannel there was a flannel shawl that belonged to her father and all the children cut the flannel shawl and took one one piece and they kept it forever can you believe that this muslin flannel were all pieces of clothing made from uh, indian or bangladeshi or pakistani raw material processed in england and sold back to us at a very high price that only our rich brahmins could afford to buy that was globalization fragmented production raw materials taken from india processed there sold back to us i think in obituary ak ramanujan has talked about it cotton and such things going uh, abroad and coming back to us no um, uh, was it in small scale reflections on a great house one of those poems not a bitchery small scale reflections on a great house so with modernity and colonialism and later with postmodernity fragmented production processes started globalized ca ca capital flow or cash flow started and today it has reached this condition what you see on the screen so many multinational corporations across the world controlling us their products take a volkswagen car for example to take an example is not produced in germany it is produced in many countries and sold in other countries the result was from the time of colonialism the result was the expansion of transnational trade and global communication networks this is called globalization global communication networks transnational trade which led to globalization 
globalization led to the diminished role of the nation states. The nation state is no longer all powerful. The governments of all nations are controlled by multinational corporations. Corporations control the governments. They give uh, governments money. You know, that happens in every country, including India. In the globalized postmodern scenario, nation states are controlled by corporations. And we people live within a global consumer culture. We eat American snacks and watch uh, Korean TV and um, sing African music and, you know, like that. Drive uh, Japanese cars and so on and so forth. We have a global consumer culture. This in turn led to the rise of knowledge elites and technocracy, people with command over technology, people who control communications networks. Why did Mukesh Ambani start uh, uh, investment in communication and education? Why do corporations enter communication and education sectors? Because that is the way to mind control people. Knowledge elites emerged, people who sell knowledge large scale and technocracy started. Increased, it increased our com consumerism, which in turn increased the pollution, and we are all subjected to neo-imperialism within this globalized scenario. Neo-imperialism means the rule of corporations over uh, post-colonial countries. The it also means the over-reliance on images and illusory experiences. We want movies, we want uh, illusory experiences of different kinds. Remember so many apps that come to us in our mobile phones. You must all have seen that uh, stress relieving app. You can dig your finger into something that looks like phone uh, and it will look like your finger is going into some mushy uh, fluid thing. Illusory experience it is. Our filters, our, uh, you know, you, you can buy, you can download apps. And if you prescribe to these, I mean, subscribe to these apps, um, you can change your face and make it look much prettier. Why do you want to do that? Because illusory experience is what we want. Why do we have selfies which do not really look like us? Because what we want is illusory experience. So cultural studies focuses on the intersections of postmodern culture with globalized economies and technologically mediated experiences. That is characteristic of postmodernity. Next, cultural studies is about everyday life. Cultural studies analyzes everyday life and practices, especially life in the metropolises. Life in the metropolises, life in the context of, uh, you know, studying culture in the context of lifestyles, consumption, social relations, etc., so on and so forth, that are peculiar to certain uh, locations and cultures. You know, that is why travel also has become important in cultural studies. You travel and talk about cultures. You travel and talk about their everyday lives. When you take travel narratives, it's also about everyday lives and cultures. Travel uh, studies intersects with cultural studies. We now understand that culture is not an unchanging objective monolithic entity. We have long understood that culture is a changing process. It's a flux. It's the result of experience, subjectivity, language. It is constructed in language. It is constructed in ideology. Look at these girls in the picture. They all have very slim legs, especially the, those two standing near the metro train. It is the shape of the female body or the shape of the human body is a metropolitan shape of the female body is a peculiar shape. Wearing tight jeans, very thin legs and slim body. Hair usually put up or you don't have long hair in a choti that is plaited. Hair either put up like this or worn slightly long, you know, carrying a bag, wearing loose tops mostly, et cetera, et cetera. The clothes create a shape of the human body. That shape of the human body is part of everyday life and part of cultural studies, for example. 
Raymond Williams, it was, who talked about lived cultures. When you talk about everyday culture, you have to talk about Raymond Williams' concept of lived cultures. Lived cultures as against monolithic, homogeneous, objective culture. Lived culture is against the concept of uh, homogeneous or monolithic culture. Lived cultures is about the food that we eat. That is why street food is important in cultural studies. Uh, you know, uh, lived culture is about the fashions we adopt. It is about the entertainments we engage in. That is why we talk about uh, video games or uh, web series or uh, Hollywood movies, etc., as part of cultural studies. It is about the festivals we celebrate. Lived cultures or everyday culture denotes a fragmented plural space. Every one of these people live a different life. They are not homogeneous. They live in fragmented plural spaces where meanings are continuously created and constructed and contested. Meanings are constructed as well as contested in this plural space. Everyday life is related to power and raises questions like who has access to metro? Who has access to certain forms of culture? Who has access? If you go to Thailand, wearing a sari and try to enter a pub, I don't know if it is like that in India. Not in India, I think. If you go to Thailand wearing a sari, you won't, be you won't be entering a pub. You have a certain dress code. You have to dress like a metropolitan youth. You know, you can't enter a pub or bar or um, any such uh, metropolitan spaces if you do not belong to that category of class. Did you understand? I remember uh, once my husband and me, um, long, long ago, there was a, a food festival happening in one five-star restaurant and we wore very uh, ordinary clothes. Uh, my, my salwar was even torn, I think. My kameez was even torn, I think. And I was wearing some slippers and I uh, unkempt look. We went to this five-star restaurant and the gatekeeper stopped me and said, where are you going? Insulted. I had the money and I, I was capable of uh, eating at a five-star restaurant, but he stopped me because of my looks. And then I put on an air and spoke to him in English with a stilted accent. And then immediately he opened the door and let me in. This happened in my life. So the English that you speak, the clothes that you wear, all give you access to certain forms of culture. And what are the legitimate uh, forms of culture acceptable in everyday life, who has access to these forms of culture, etc., come under the purview of cultural studies. A few more things. Cultural studies is about resistance and counterculture. I have already talked about power and all these things. I don't have to wax eloquent. Look at the, um, the trendy look of a young man these days. This is the trendy look, or he might look like this. You know, this is the um, look of the trendy metropolitan young man. And this originated in resistance movements. This look originated in resistance movements. Capitalism, globalization, uh, all these have generated margins in the society that made it necessary for resistance to happen, for alternative cultures to emerge. And countercultures of dissent have emerged starting from the 1960s. The countercultural movements have resisted the corporate control on our lives. They have resisted homogenization of cultures. All these, these looks are related to the, uh, the concept of the hipster, for example. In the 1950s, a countercultural movement that all of us know about is Beatnik generation or Beat generation. The hippies were there. A countercultural movement in literature would be uh, the, the, the literary works of Arundhati Roy, we can say. From the uh, work of the theorist Theodore Rozak, counterculture has become a very important concept within cultural studies. Please don't draw on the screen. Can you please erase it? The next concept is that of the nation. The nation is understood in cultural studies as a very diverse discourse constructed from a set of narratives. The narrative of the flag, the narrative of the independence movement, the narrative of Gandhism. 
so many the narrative of nationalism rutu please don't draw on the screen the nation is now understood as a discourse constructed from a set of such narratives especially history literature media popular culture etc and uh, the concept of the nation lays emphasis on the origin of the nation we give importance to in cultural studies we give importance to the origin of the nation the traditions of the nation the continuity of the nation the timelessness of the nation as well the continuity uh, and timelessness of the nation as well as the temporality that uh, even e t s eliot talked about in tradition and the individual talent the formation of the nation as involving the foregrounding of certain rituals and practices on independence day we all wear certain clothes or um, you know do certain things we put up little flags on our cars these are rituals that create the concept of the nation or the concept of culture the concept of bharat varsha which has been appropriated by hindutva the nation also entails ideas of a pure original people which is very oppressive as we have seen in recent times the idea of a pure original people of india is very oppressive the idea of a very pure original people of america is also very problematic american whites are saying we are the original americans all the immigrants can go and you have seen me memes like this the native american is asking oh really you are the original people really the native americans are asking so what is the nation as uh, benedict anderson has said cultural studies would also say that nations are imagined communities then the next is uh, our uh, concept of nation as represented in the taj mahal our our symbols of the nation i have put here the taj mahal or uh, a movie like gunjan saxena uh, the true story of uh, the kargil girl or many such nationalistic movies puri etc creating the concept of the nation that is another example next we have to talk a little bit about multiculturalism and culture studies perspective on it culture studies understands that cultures are always coexisting with one another when cultures coexist like that there emerge issues of equal opportunity affirmative action representation culture studies addresses these issues within multiculturalism you will see lots of literary examples for all this how multiculturalism leads to uh, you know denial of opportunities how multiculturalism leads to the definition uh, of what is a national culture and what is not national culture for example the concept of post colonial liberalism that is a related concept by which individuals and communities within multiculturalism are understood as equal and free there is a concept called post colonial liberalism that means within a multicultural society everybody is free and equal that is called post colonial liberalism culture studies looks at various intersections of cultures in a multicultural society how cultures intersect in so many different ways to create new forms of life to create changing patterns of family to create new moralities culture studies is about all that you can do that uh, using literature and lastly the last point that i want this is a representation of multiculturalism the last point for today uh, before that there are some memes that i have put here multiculturalism and trump you want to send kids back to school when there's a surge in coronavirus cases and you have no plan why should we let you put our children at risk and trump is saying relax when have i ever put children at risk look at the migrant children in the border detention <laughs> multiculturalism in india i'm sufia a muslim and an indian till i die you know the context multiculturalism and hitler hitler was a purist he was against multiculturalism obviously hitler wanted to wipe out the jews and give germany to the aryans aryan supremacy he believed in 
and uh, lastly fundamentalism i i will uh, talk about fundamentalism in relation to hitler there has been in the contemporary times this is the last few minutes will you please switch off your mics please switch off your mics yeah thank you last point that i am talking to you today is about fundamentalism it is prescribed in some universities as a topic Fundam i have taken uh, many of these ideas from very important culture studies books including uh, the books of pramod nair sir uh, so many other culture studies books that i have in my library i have used uh, pramod nair sir i think has talked about fundamentalism there has been an increasing intolerance in contemporary societies hatred towards xenophobia towards the other this is related to insecurity insecurity and uh, intolerance go hand in hand in post industrial post war world leading to fundamentalism fundamentalism as you know as you as you have in india as well as in many other countries is the chauvinistic rejection of any alternate way of thinking our way of thinking is right all other ways are wrong that idea is called fundamentalism we talk about islamic fundamentalism uh you know muslims can talk about hindu fundamentalism non americans can talk about american fundamentalism and so on and so forth in the 20th century fundamentalism has emerged as a reaction against modernization a going back to traditions as you see in india for example a going back to our roots our traditions against modernization that is what fundamentalism is about because modernization was traumatic for many social groups modernization was not easy it led to the destruction of a lot of traditions and cultures and things like that histories so fundamentalism takes a recourse back to the roots and uh, origins against modernization against developments uh, and modernity in response fundamentalism uh, in response to modernization fundamentalism seeks a renewal of and an aggressive return to a narrowly defined tradition a purest narrowly defined tradition fundamentalism seeks to go back to uh, uh, something that they call origins or roots something that they call true religion and scriptures uh, we don't know how to define these origins or truth or purity these are all provisional concepts they don't exist but fundamentalism makes use of these terms as a reaction against modernity cultural studies explore various manifestations and consequences of fundamentalism especially in relation to social class politics identity ideology and so on and so forth so that is the last uh, point that i wanted to make today uh, tomorrow i will begin from the beginning i will begin from the beginning and talk to you about uh, the emergence of cultural studies and um, the propagation of uh, cultural studies and the many branches that cultural studies has taken and uh, so on and so forth i hope you enjoyed uh, today's uh, discussion i have uh, stopped exactly 2 hours uh, we have talked about this and i hope i will be able to keep time tomorrow is there anybody who wants to Uh, talk to me or ask me something. Did you enjoy? Are you tired? Uh, share with me something, and then we can call it a day or night. Thank you so We're much, totally ma'am. You're totally way interest, of ma'am. Totally interested. Clarification. Interest. I just explained it. It is just explained, ma'am. Thank you so much. When I teach in a class, oh, yes. not boring. Uh, let me give you one clarification. When I teach in a class, I teach like a class. I teach like a class. But when I do a public lecture, I have to. Uh, try to rise uh, above uh, an ordinary class, and I have to give it like a uh, you know Central University standard lecture or something, if possible. I don't know if it's possible for me, uh, but uh, it is. It is not possible when I'm teaching in a class. So that is why I throw open topics like cultural studies to the public because not only will everybody benefit from it, but I will also transcend my limitations and try to do my best. Uh, it is. Um, it is good that we discuss uh, these uh, issues like cultural studies in such a large framework that's why okay. we did not we did, did not look at our watch at all ma'am so fantastic 
really exactly. organized not a single minute i felt bored thank you ma'am it was a very great session with practical examples yeah i wanted to give you that because culture studies is all about practical everyday examples and so many speak ma'am but they don't add this spark when they are speaking i don't know maybe it's god gift that you have we just speak and we don't look here and there i did not allow anybody in my room i said two hours no disturbance and we are here amazing right. ma'am you should listen to this video again please yeah we will definitely ma'am sure, it's ma'am. really fantastic nice ma'am thank you so much for enlightening us i'm so, i'm you sure there are so many of you who want to say a lot of things and uh you might it might because of time you may not be because of other reasons uh for for me also i i need to wind up because i can't go on and on and on like this so thank you very much uh please uh, join us to join me tomorrow also uh, without fail uh it will be an amazing beginning to your research and uh, an amazing boost for your future career so thank you very much i'm ending the program thank you Thank you.